Great, thank you. Um, so uh, I will be making some forward-looking statements, so please refer to our SEC filings for, uh, for reference there on the risk associated with the company. But before starting, uh, first of all, I, I want to congratulate ARM for all the amazing work that, that, that is going on in ARM. It's, it's really, really quite, re quite rewarding to see not only an audience like this, but some of the impact that ARM is having on the field and the industry. So I think we owe them a lot of, a lot of thanks. Um, and uh, I come from Bluebird Bio. We come from the fake Cambridge, um, not the real Cambridge, in Massachusetts. Well, most people uh, know us uh, for a few things, but I, I actually want to talk about some of the things that, that people don't fully appreciate, I think, about us. But, but people know us for our culture of passion um, and building a culture of very, very focused on patient impact um, and hiring fundamentally great people. And, 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 and that really is true of, of the employees of Bluebird that are now um, 500 plus strong across not only Cambridge, but now in Zug, Switzerland, getting ready hopefully for a launch there. In North Carolina with the 125,000 square foot manufacturing facility that we recently acquired. And also in Seattle where we have our gene editing platform, which is growing uh, quite rapidly. We're known for blue sneakers, uh, known for now, hopefully three and two three filings in the next two years. And I'll get to that in a second. People know certainly of our sickle cell data, both the, the good and the bad, and now hopefully back to the good. Um, know us for our CAR-T program, BB2121 targeting multiple myeloma. Uh, and uh, some know us for our cash balance um, as well, which is, is quite nice to be in that position. But, but I don't know that people really appreciate the depth of the science and the technologies that have been accumulated really over the last five, six, seven years to enable that and to propel us into the next phase of growth for, for the company. And some examples of that are our ex vivo gene uh, addition uh, manufacturing capabilities, whether it be our transduction enhancers, which are proving out in the clinic right now with uh, TDT and uh, sickle cell, our PA3 kinase enhancements um, in our oncology program, 21217. Some of the suspension work that we have ongoing, you've heard some of that here in the last two uh, panels. Um, our ex vivo um, gene editing platform. We just had some data come out at ACR, uh, preclinical data showing our ability to turn a, uh, a negative uh, immunosuppressive signal, a PD-1 signal, turn that off. At the same time, turn on IL-12 locally within uh, the cell. So you're turning basically an immunosuppressive signal into a positive inflammatory signal locally at, uh, at uh, the tumor site. Um, that's, the, that's the proposal there, but the data are re quite compelling in the first real example of that. Um, in oncology, uh, certainly our CAR T, TCR, and Gamma Delta plays now, so pretty broad play in oncology. Um, and then our commercial infrastructure. People realize, I think, that we're becoming a pre-commercial company, soon to be commercial, knock on wood, that our first filings uh, are successful. But we're laying down global commercial um, supply chain, building to scale. Um, obviously, we're going to need to with those programs. Building the COE model, which is very patient-centric. And then have, starting to have these pricing conversations locally in Europe, some in the United States around pricing models. So we're right in the thick of the reality of commercial deployment, and um, hopefully we'll, we'll need that. Uh, and then uh, the other thing is the foundational IP that we have. It was mentioned that, um, uh, that others have uh, royalties associated with uh, gene therapy products, as, as we've disclosed. We have uh, relationships with GSK and Novartis. Um, for single-digit royalties on those programs. So some of the foundational IP that we have um, accumulated over the years is also not fully probably uh, uh, understood. Um, so I'm going to quickly get to a couple of, of slides here. Uh, this really speaks to the fact that we are obviously very focused on the patient, but the employees that I referenced are near and dear to us, and, and the hiring that we go through and the, the, the uh, attention that we pay to every employee hired is different, I believe. Um, this is the, the three and two slide, which we disclosed last year, or this past year, at, uh, um, at J.P. Morgan, filing TDT hopefully this year, the intent of filing both CALD and multiple myeloma with cell gene next year, and then this year giving some hopefully more guidance on um, the regulatory path for sickle cell based on some of the data that came out at ASH. We clearly are in an amazing ecosystem. In many ways, we've driven some of this, not all of it, obviously. Whether it be the regulatory atmosphere, the approvals, hopefully more coming, 
the pricing reimbursement environment, which I think is, is very favorable to companies like Bluebird uh, and the gene therapy field and cell therapy field. And then clearly there are lots of players that are recognizing this ecosystem and the value of data emerging, ours and others. Uh, we do think that this year is going to be a breakthrough year for us going forward. It, 17 was. Um, and we showed across our CALD program, whether it be 15 out of 17 patients hitting the primary endpoint, um, TDT, where we're progressing to our first filing in the EU this year, subsequently in the U.S. based on clinical data, um, leveraging our manufacturing improvements. Sickle cell at ASH, we disclosed again some early data suggesting that we think we're back on track. Um, relative to the New England Journal patient that had uh, arguably a very, very good outcome. Uh, and then in multiple myeloma, you hopefully have seen the data at the end of this year, which really showed that we're having somewhat unprecedented uh, response rates, both uh, complete response and, and partial response, with a seemingly manageable safety profile. So more, more data cro coming across all of these programs throughout uh, 2018, but it really is anchored in these two themes of having a, a transformative impact for patients and their families, and making sure that we stay um, focused on the mission going forward, which is very patient-centric. So that was a quick run. Um, so I don't know if we, we've got some time for some questions. Indeed. Um, our, so Blue's obviously invested quite a bit um, to commercialize its products, including uh, pretty, having a fairly formidable manufacturing engine set up. Can you talk to what extent um, Blue might be involved in industry consolidation or, or whether it'll happen even outside of Blue, just given that so many companies have a single product. Sure. So I, I think because of all of the things that I just referenced in terms of the commitment to not just the existing clinical programs, but continuing to innovate um, and advance uh, the company both on the commercial side as well as expanding the pipeline, uh, we find ourselves in a pretty good position and a fairly unique position having a plethora of technologies that we're leveraging not just for the severe genetic disease platform, but also in the oncology world, and more of that to come, obviously, beyond hopefully 2121. Um, we've seen 2121.7 as an example of that. Investing heavily in manufacturing, so not only the five major collaborations we have globally for both vector and drug product, but now the manufacturing facility that we own in North Carolina. Um, and then, obviously, continuing to invest in partnerships because we don't believe we can do this alone, whether that be through technology partnerships like we've done with TC Bio and Medigene uh, on the oncology side, um, as well as the collaboration with uh, Boston Children's for the next generation sickle cell program where we're going after RNA um, um, downregulation uh, for sickle cell. So I think we find ourselves in a very unique position having a broad set of capabilities tools, and now we're laying the commercial infrastructure there. That provides us, I believe, with an opportunity to be a partner of choice of some sort um, because we bring to the table lots of, of capabilities and experiences that others don't yet have, whether it be on the commercial side or experiencing some of the challenges, for example, we saw in sickle cell, where it took us two years to come back to what we think is a manufacturing and protocol changes that are going to lead us toward more 1204-like outcomes. So from that perspective, I think we are in a good position and we continue to have a pretty robust set of conversations with folks um, in terms of bringing products in, bringing technologies in, and that should carry through for a while, um, I believe, and it's, it's, a, it's a right time for the company to, to, to leverage that. Outside of that, I, I can't comment on the broader, broader industry. Right. So you're a genetic medicines company uh, known as being an innovator for, for lentiviral vector uh, gene editing. Um, are there sparks, parts of the genetic medicine space that you won't be involved in that sort of are outside of, of your charter, let's say? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, we've uh, historically looked very seriously at AAV um, at times throughout the history that I've been there, and I've been there seven years, and we've probably looked at various times, um, several times throughout that time frame. Um, I, I wouldn't say that there's any that we wouldn't jump into. Um, you can see that we are kind of the anti-pure play, as we call it. There are gene editing companies that are very focused on using that tool to solve a problem. Uh, we've taken a different approach. Uh, it's been, it was actually just referenced in the, in the last conversation, the right tool for the right job. And so we have capabilities, certainly in lentiviral delivery. We have capabilities in gene editing. 
We have capabilities now in protein engineering, um, and we have capabilities now through our collaboration in, in our RNA uh, downregulation, uh, through the sickle cell collaboration. Um, AAV is a field we have not played in yet, even though we use AAV internally um, for certain applications. We're looking at in vivo, so um, some of the liquid nanoparticle technologies we have now in-house or licensed in and have some applications there, preclinical, obviously. Um, so we, we act based on the problem at hand from a clinical and patient perspective and then uh, ultimately gain access to the tools and technologies we think most, uh, most well fits that situation. We've done that historically. So there's not one that jumps to mind that we wouldn't jump into. There's some that we haven't jumped into for, for a whole host of reasons historically. Right. So Unless you had something in mind. Well, specifically, you, you may. Well, I, I, I can't comment there. But um, let, let me just move to the next question. Um, so you're, you're going into uncharted waters as one of the first gene therapy uh, companies in, as far as launches. Um, so obviously, there's a lot of opportunity, but there's also a lot of risk. How, how do you balance the two as CFO and CSO to ensure, obviously, the upside and the revenue generation, but also mitigate the risk to the organization? Yeah, it, it's, it really, for us, is all about getting that first experience right, well, as right as we can get it, um, and learn through that first launch. So that subsequent launches, we're in a, a little bit of a privileged position in that we do have subsequent launches already lined up, again, predicated on data, continuous, continue to look good, and regulatory authorities agreeing with, with the data. But um, we are excited about the prospect of multiple launches over time in Europe and the U.S. and setting up the infrastructure there. But there are clear challenges in front of us, and we're experiencing some of those right now as we learn on a country-by-country -country basis about uh, both the opportunities and the excitement about gene therapy, but also about the, um, the challenges associated with setting up a COE model in a given institution and understanding the challenges there, understanding country by country what are the opportunities and challenges associated with a true pay for performance model, which is where we'd prefer to go uh, and where we're trying to push the conversation. But there are some barriers that need to be broken down in order to get there in some countries. Others, it's, they're more receptive to it because they've done it historically. So um, we're learning as we go, and I think those learnings are going to bode well for us for the future launches as long as we don't really get it wrong out the gates, which I don't anticipate we will because we're spending a fair amount of money and hiring the right people in Europe in particular for our first launch. So um, we have to get that right. If we don't get that right, it doesn't matter what follows. Um, and we also have to get it right for the sake of the, the field too and making sure that, that the, the mistakes that we inevitably make are small ones that can be corrected and modified and we learn and evolve as a, as a group and a field. Great. And, and the last question for me, um, and I think you talked about this a little bit before, but what, what do you think is most underappreciated about Blue? What, what do you wish investors came to the table knowing? Yeah, I think there's a bit of a catch-22 with, with uh, who we are in that we've got some arguably exciting clinical programs that uh, hopefully will be marching toward a broader set of patients uh, in the not-too-distant future. We historically have been very quiet about our preclinical pipeline and the technologies and how we deploy them. You're starting to see some of that. At ASH, we had a few posters giving a sense of how we're deploying our gene editing technology and others. It's the first time we referenced the Schmier clinical program at Boston Children's that we have a partnership with Boston Children's on. Um, this is the, the RNA-targeted uh, uh, technology. And um, so that's the part that I wish they understood. But frankly, we haven't given a lot um, publicly to, to help people understand. I think that's going to that's gonna change over time. We'll start becoming more articulate about how the pipeline is building as it approaches the clinic. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you.